Good evening. It's time to begin our worship service. In a moment, Brett will be having our scripture reading. Fred will be leading our uh, singing. Bud will have our opening prayer. Frank will have our closing prayer. And Jamie's operating our AV booth. Some of our announcements. Uh, please remember our uh, Potter's Children's Home Commodity Collection for next week. Uh, we have 100% juice boxes. Uh, we have the Bears for Kids project. There's a need for more to partic participate in this program, especially for those who are willing to sew. Uh, for more information, please contact uh, Beverly or Jan Myers. Gloria Browning wishes to thank the congregation for all the prayers concerning her recent surgery and to let everyone know how much the cards to her uh, daughter Carmen uh, were appreciated. Uh, please uh, look at the uh, prayer list that's in the bulletin. It's very extensive. We have some special requests. Uh, Peter Gallagher, who's Michelle's brother, brother-in-law, di was diagnosed with early stage ALS. Jerry Lynn, who's Michelle's sister, has a tor torn meniscus and an ACL and having surgery next Wednesday. Uh, Phyllis's granddaughter, Lexi, is having surgery February the 8th to remove the right side of her thyroid. So please remember all these in your prayers. That's all I have announcements that I have at this time. We will begin our worship service with our scripture reading. And that once again is from 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 15 through 18. See that no one renders evil for evil to anyone, but always pursue what is good, both for yourselves and for all. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, and everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. This time we'll start a worship and song. Next first selection is I Want to Be a Worker. It's all sing. I want to be a worker for the Lord. Next selection is Earth, Earth Holds No Treasure. Earth Holds No Treasure.
time I'll have opening prayer. Would you please bow with me as we go to God in prayer? Most kind and loving Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for yet another opportunity this Lord's Day to assemble together to worship you. Father, we're so grateful that you take care of us and provide us a place of worship that we can come to you without fear of molestation. And, and Father, we pray that all that is said and done in this service will be found well-pleasing in your sight. Father, at this time, we also ask that you continue to watch out over each of us. Father, we have brothers and sisters who are ill and have difficulties, and we have uh, those that have lost loved ones recently, and we pray that you comfort them as only you know how. Father, for our faithful Christians, you've taught us that there is no fear of death, for we will be with you forever. And Father, we pray that the world will come to know and to understand that and come to you and serve you for the whatever remaining lives we have. Father, we're grateful for our elders as they shepherd over us and our deacons as they work and for each of our members. We're also so thankful for your son, Jesus. He gave his life for us and cared enough for us that we can come to you in prayer. Father, we always ask that you forgive us for our sins as we repent and turn from those things that we shouldn't do and help us to be better servants unto you. And by studying, we'll be able to better help the world. Father, all this we ask in your son's name. Amen. Thank you, bud. The uh, invitation song will be 454, Nothing But the Blood. Before the lesson this evening, I want to sing 243, which home with the soul. It's all safe. It looks like we have been after our letters are
as you read and study from the book of 1 Thessalonians, what a very encouraging letter this was that was sent to the brethren there in Thessalonica. At the beginning, of course, Paul expressed his thankfulness, his gratitude for these brethren, how that they were conducting themselves, how they were living, thankful for their patience, thankful for their work, thankful for their labor of love, and for the example that they were setting for others. And so in this letter, Paul wanted to remind them of things and also to instruct them in some things because as the time in which the congregation was established, Paul did not get to stay very long in Thessalonica, but he had to leave very quickly. And so he's only there for a short period of time. And so this letter being sent back to them to remind them of some things that he had taught them, but also to remind them of some things that they had not yet been taught. And as we're getting to toward the end of this letter, and in chapter 5, as we broke this chapter down, the first 22 verses of this chapter this morning, in this way that Paul reminds them of the day of the Lord Jesus Christ in verses 1 through 11. And then beginning in verse 12 through verse 15, he reminds them of the duty that they had toward different ones. Talked about the elders, talked about the brethren, talked about all people. And in verse 15, as he concludes his admonition to them, reference to their duty that they had to all. But he, he says there, but ever follow that which is good. As so as he's bringing this letter to a close, he reminds them that uh, among all the other things he's been emphasizing to them, follow New King James says, pursue, follow, ever follow that which is good. You can never go wrong when you follow that which is good. But in order to follow that which is good, we have to understand what is good. We have to understand what is involved in that. And so beginning in verse 16 of this letter, Paul is giving them directions. In reference to how that they can follow that which is good. There's a day of the Lord. There are the duties you have. And so now he gives directions to them. As he just admonished them to be good, follow that which is good, verse 15. Now he's giving them directions in reference to how they can accomplish that. And that is in following that which is good. And in this section, verses 16 through 22, we briefly broke that down this morning in reference to mainly three main points, as you break down the directions, the instructions that Paul were, was giving to them in reference to following good, it involved, number one, 
developing certain things in their life. And that's verse 16, verse 17, and verse 18. Secondly, the directions he's giving to them about following that which is good demands that they discontinue some things. And that's verses 19 and 20. And then when you look at verses 21 through 22, Paul reminds them that they're going to have to discern not just some things, not just certain things, but they are to discern all things. Develop some things in your life, discontinue some things in your life, but discern all things. Because if you're going to follow these directions I'm giving to you, and if you're going to follow after that which is good, then you're going to have to establish what is good. And then when you do that, then you have to hold on to that which is good. And you're going to have to stay away from that which is evil. And this is basically what Paul, the directions he's giving them as they strive to follow that which is good. So if you got all those points, then I'm through. I got your attention then. It's a, oh, Jerry's through? Let's give him a lot of attention. Um, let's look at this a little bit more closely. As you look at these directions that Paul gives to them. Notice there are things that they are to develop. And you can talk about you can, you can talk about certain attitudes, certainly that is the case. But also these attitudes lead to certain actions that must help them to be good. We understand that. But in verse 16, we know what it says. Paul says to rejoice evermore. Again, I remind you that when you look at these things found here in verse 16 through 22, these are commands. These are not suggestions. This is not a multiple choice. Over to Paul's not saying, okay, now look through all that list I'm giving you. Look through all those directions I'm giving you. Pick out a few of those you like. And you can put the others on a shelf somewhere. You can forget about it. No, that's not what Paul is saying. Every one of these things. Remember, the goal is to make sure that they're following that which is good. Now, if you're going to do that, here's what you must develop in your life. There must be this attitude of gladness in your life. Attitude of gladness. You know, attitudes are by choice. You can have any kind of attitude you want. You want. If you want a good attitude, you can develop it. If you don't want a good attitude, it's your choice. But it's not something that's given to you. It's not, okay, I have a bad attitude today. I don't know where it came from. It just showed up. That's not the way it works. 
Sometimes we like to think that it just showed up because we don't like the attitude we have now. And so that way we're not responsible, you see, because it just showed up. I don't know where it came from, but I got a bad attitude today. Don't deal with me. I'm grumpy. I'm grouchy. I, I just stay away. You know, that is by choice. That's by choice. And Paul says here that if you're ever going to follow that, which is good, you have to develop this attitude of gladness in your life. Now, it begins in the heart, in the mind of a person. And therefore, that's why he says here to rejoice, rejoice, Don't bring, don't bring the junk into this and start talking about what's happening in your life or what people are saying or what people are doing. That has nothing to do with the attitude that you are to develop in order to follow that which is good. Now, I understand that some people around you makes it easier for you to develop the right kind of attitude. I understand that. I also understand that there are some people that are around us, it makes it more difficult to develop the right kind of attitude. I understand that. But whether it's easy or whether it's difficult. You know, the Lord never said, no, okay, now I want you to do this if it's easy for you to do it. Do you, do you read anything in Scripture along that line? It's not there. And so Paul says, rejoice. Now again, I remind you, this, talking about continual action here with each one of these things in this passage, verse 16 through 22. And he emphasizes that by saying the word that he uses here, rejoice evermore. Hmm. How long is that? When is that? You know, I, I, I want to get over there in evermore so I can rejoice. Now, you, you, you probably don't know this, but I'll let you know there are some mean people in the world. There are some ugly people in the world. I'm not talking about from a physical standpoint. We all understand that. And all we've got to do sometimes is just look in the mirror but there's some ugly acting people in the world. I understand that. We all understand that. And sometimes we find ourselves in that boat. Why? Why? Because we have stopped developing the good things in our life. And we started focusing on the garbage that is all around. But that's my choice. If I want to follow that which is good, I, I, I've got to develop this attitude of gladness. That is, I've got to rejoice. I must rejoice evermore. How can I rejoice? How can I rejoice? Look at where we are as children of God. Where are we? From a spiritual standpoint, where are we? Every accountable person is either in Jesus Christ or the outside of Jesus Christ. Every accountable person is either in the body of Christ or outside the body of Christ. Every accountable person is either a member of the family of God or they're a part of the devil's family. 
That's the only two choices every accountable person has. Every kind of a person either has biblical hope or no hope right now of getting to heaven. Every accountable person. And if I'm in Christ, if I'm in the body of Christ, if I'm in the kingdom of God, if I'm in the family of God, if I'm a servant of righteousness, I have hope. I have hope. Now you tell me. Of course, you know that's just a phrase. I don't want anybody telling me anything right now. Not that I will not listen. Why is it not difficult? Why is it so difficult to develop this attitude? If people would just stop and think. Oh, that may be it right there. One of the reasons why. Paul says rejoice evermore. Verse 17. We are to Remember, God in praying to Him. That is developing this attitude of mind that we are giving in and giving ourselves over and depending upon and relying upon God. Whenever you read in Scripture about Prayer. We need to understand what that is reminding us of, and that is our dependence upon God. I said, We're giving in. And we're giving ourselves over to God. We're going to spend time in prayer to God. A person cannot ever follow that which is good if he's not remembering to pray to God. See, what that does is, that caused me to think about the fact that, listen, I'm not in this all by myself. It's not all about me having to do certain things. Now, certainly we are commanded to do certain things. We understand that. But listen, God. I saw this attitude that we develop. I want to ever follow that which is good. So guess who I need to depend upon? In Psalm 55, verse 22, the psalmist says, Cast thy burden upon the Lord, and he shall sustain thee. And so pray without ceasing. Colossians 4, 2, Paul says, continue in prayer. Notice the action. Paul 
pray without ceasing. Continue in prayer. You're talking about bringing about developing right kind of attitudes as we seek to follow that which is good. Here we are. We're going to depend upon God. We're going to look to Him. And we pray. And as we do so, we pray according to His will. 1 John 5, verse 14 through 15. Yes, asking of God. Expressing our gratitude to Him. Then verse 18, Paul says, In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. If we're going to follow that which is good, it demands the attitude of gladness to be developed. Therefore, we will be rejoicing evermore. That demands the attitude of mind that says, I'm giving in and giving over to God. I'm going to depend upon Him. And that means I will be praying without ceasing. That doesn't mean every second I'm uttering a prayer. But now number three, if I want to follow that which is good, that demands that I develop an attitude of gratitude. And therefore, I am reflecting upon every day of my life as I think about why I can rejoice and as I think about how that I can depend upon God in my life. And then I look at that. In every thing, give thanks. A person will not ever follow after that which is good if they have not developed the attitude of gratitude and take the time to give thanks. You see, because it is that person that takes the time to give thanks to God. Yes, he's depending upon God. He knows what prayer is. He understands that. And he can rejoice even more. Because he's got so much to be thankful for. Never being able to repay God everything he has done for us. Let me suggest to you, as you think about this, Jim, last Wednesday evening, in his devotional, talked about Forgiveness, about forgiving 
each other, the need for that and how to do that and so forth. You take a person who has developed an attitude of gratitude. When it comes to getting along with others, when it comes to doing the things we know that we should be doing to help others, to strengthen them, And, and sometimes when something comes up that creates a little difficulty, a person who has an attitude of gratitude is not going to think twice when a person comes to that individual and say, I know what I did. I know what I said was wrong. I'm sorry. Because we are thankful to God. And we are depending upon God. And we're rejoicing in those things that God has given to us. It is not going to be difficult to say to someone who has harmed us, who has hurt us in some way, I forgive you. When they repent. How many times you've heard someone say, I cannot forgive that individual? I'm trying to think how to express this in words. When a person says, I cannot forgive you, number one, they are lying. And the reason I know that they're lying, there are several reasons. The main reason is, God has commanded us, not suggested to us, God has commanded us to forgive. In Ephesians 4.32, Paul says, And be ye kind one to another. Can you be? Well, I don't know. Wait a minute. Paul says, Be ye kind. You know what that is? Be ye kind one to another, tender hearted. What's the next word? Forgiving one another. If you feel like it. Is that what Paul said? You know it's not. Forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. God's forgiveness of us. What a blessing that is. And then we can't forgive someone else. It's not a matter of can't. Because God commands it. And God does not command anything that we can't do. So when a person says, I cannot forgive that person. Well, no, no that, you're not using the right words. Let's use the right words here. The words are, I will not forgive that person. That's the words. The words are, I choose not to forgive that person. You see, when I, when I say I can't forgive, that sort of sounds like, okay, maybe you can't. You know, that doesn't sound as bad. But when you come up and say, I'm not going to forgive that person. Whoa, what's the matter with you? you got a wrong attitude. So really what a person says when it says, I cannot forgive, they're saying, I will not do it. But you give me a person 
that is seeking, that is following, that is pursuing that which is good. And he has this attitude of gratitude and being thankful to God every day of his life. He is eager to forgive because he knows what God has done for him. Ever follow that which is good. So develop things in your life. And Paul emphasizes and Paul dictates, if you will, what we are to do along that line. Then number two, as we look at this section very quickly. In verses 19 and 20. There are things that we must discontinue. And the reason I say that is because Paul says here in these two verses, he says, quench not the Spirit. Despise not prophesying. Now, what is happening here? When you read these two verses, and we talk about there are some things here that we are to discontinue. Quench not the Spirit. Despise not prophesying. Now, you know that we read about in the New Testament about the spiritual gifts that some Christians had. Paul describes them in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. There are nine of those spiritual gifts. In chapter 13, he talks about the duration of them. In chapter 14, he talks about the demonstration of them, how they were to be demonstrated. And so here are these spiritual gifts. They were received by the laying on of the apostles' hands. So when it says, quench not the Spirit, despise not prophesying. What's the message here? Reject not. In other words, stop rejecting the teaching of the Spirit. Stop rejecting the message that is being proclaimed according to the will of God. Don't despise the truth. Do you know anybody? That has despised the truth? Do you know anyone, or have you ever heard about anyone that had a great disdain for the truth? They hated it. And they hated it with passion. Don't mention the Bible to me. Don't mention to me about marriage, divorce, and remarriage. I don't want to hear it. If I want to marry and divorce, for whatever reason I want to marry and divorce, and if I end up at three, four, five, six times being married, that's my choice. And I made that choice. I don't care if the Bible does teach that there's only one and one scriptural reason for divorce and remarriage. Now it's for fornication. Yeah, but you don't understand what was happening. In my, uh, it doesn't matter. I regret those things happening. But it does not change the truth. Truth is not established based on what is happening in our life. That's not the way we determine truth. Well, I, I don't like this, and I don't like that. Paul is emphasizing to these brethren, as you continue on from this point, as you seek and to pursue and to follow that which is good, 
listen to the message from those who are speaking the truth. Is that not something that we must do today? Of course it is. Now, we don't have what they had back then during that time. We don't have these spiritual gifts as they did. We don't have them. They're not available today. The reason for them is no longer valid. The means to obtain them is no longer there. But what we do have is we have the revealed will of God. The message inspired by the Holy Spirit. God through the Holy Spirit given His message. We have it and we can look to it. We can learn it. And we can live by it so that we can follow that which is good. Then in verses 21 and 22, notice the words. Paul said, prove all things. Again, I emphasize to you, not only the word prove, but the word all. Not just some, not just certain things, but prove all things. Now, you're talking about from a spiritual standpoint. Now, if you want to drive a Dodge truck rather than a Ford truck, okay, that's okay. And you can try to prove to us, to somebody else, that that's a lot better. But we're not talking about that. If you want to live in a certain kind of house and you want to try to prove to somebody else, this is the kind of house you have or you need to have, okay, go ahead and do that. But that, Paul's not talking about that. If you want to try to prove that certain ties look better than other ties. See, Logan got on a beautiful tie. Everybody look at Logan's tie. <laughs> he don't have to even try to prove that. You just look at it and you say, oh, that is a beautiful tie. But listen, when it comes to following that which is good, that is what we believe, what we teach, what we practice. That must be proven. I'm breaking these two verses down in this way. To follow that which is good demands that we research all things. That we retain all things that have been examined and proven to be genuine. That is according to the scripture. And that's what he means by hold fast to that which is what? That which is what? That which is good. What's good? That which has been researched, that which has been reviewed, that which has been examined, that which has been put to the test, and there it is. It stands as genuine. It is truthful. No matter what anybody says. Retain that in your life. Because, see, if, if you're going to follow that which is good, you have to know what good is. If you're going to follow that which is good, that means you have to retain that which is good in your life. And then it says to avoid all appearance of evil. You see, there are some things that we are to 
reject. There are some things that we are to refrain from in our pursuing, seeking, and following that which is good. And so we are to retain good in our life, but we are to refrain, we are to reject that which is evil. We can determine that as we research, as we examine, as we put to the test that which is being taught, that which is being practiced, and then we verify whether it's true or not. And this is something that we want to make sure that whoever teaches, whoever preaches, here in this congregation, is one that is following that which is good. And as some of you know, whenever a situation arises that we have a speaker coming in, we don't know the individual, and others don't really know them either, they are always asked, Questions. Several pages of questions. Because we don't want just anyone presenting messages from this pulpit or in our classes. There have been occasions when we've had to say to individuals uh, the opportunity to speak has been rescinded. I'm just using some words that sound pretty nice, don't they? Basically saying, you're not preaching here. But you know, it sounds better to say, okay, the invitation has been rescinded. That has happened. Because you're not following that which is good when you permit those who are teaching things contrary to the Word of God and giving them an opportunity to spread their garbage. We have the opportunity and obligation to watch out. And we all have that. But especially, of course, elders in the congregation. Follow that which is good. Developing certain attitudes that will lead to right kind of action in life. Discontinue things in our thinking in a sense that we cannot reject God's word. Whenever truth is presented, we want to accept it. I don't care what the individual looks like. If it is truth and it is presented, I'm going to accept it. But if a message is presented and it's not truth, it must be rejected. I don't care what the individual looks like. I don't care who he is. I don't care where he went to school. I don't care how many letters he's got after his name. Because we are looking to see what we need to do to follow that which is good. Let me sum all this up. And I think when you look at this passage here, You can understand the reason why we are to follow that which is good. If you look at verse 23, after 
giving these directions to the people about what they needed to do to follow that which is good. Notice what he says. And, in other words, if these things are developed, and if you discontinue those things that you should discontinue, but if you start accepting and, and receiving God's word and, and so forth, and, and certainly if you take the time to examine everything that's being taught, making sure that your belief and your teaching, your practice is according to the word of God, and you are attaining that, you are attaining that, you retain that good, you reject that which is evil. Notice the result. And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. And I pray your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless in the day or in the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. How do you want to appear at the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ? Paul says, I pray. The God of peace, yes, we know what's going to, the God of peace will sanctify you wholly. And I pray that your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless unto the coming. If we're going to have hope of being presented to the Lord at that last great day as being one that is holy, H-O-L-Y, what does that mean that we must follow in this life? That which is good. Here's what's going to happen, Paul says. Fred is about to lead us in a song. It's a song of encouragement. For those who have not yet obeyed the gospel, we know the importance of the gospel how that it is God's power under salvation, Romans 1, 16. Certainly it must be believed, but also we understand it must be obeyed. And therefore, when faith is developed, hopefully that faith will lead us to repent of sins in our life and to confess Christ and to be baptized for the mission of our sins. And then we can begin to follow that which is good. If that is your need this evening, we encourage you to respond. If it is your need as a child of God, you have stopped following the good. That needs to be changed. Because when you stop following the good, you can't be before the Lord as one that is holy, as one that is unspotted. So let's correct that this evening as well. If you need to respond, we not come as together we stand and as we sing.
want to ask if there's anyone that needs to partake of the Lord's Supper this evening. If you would, raise your hand. If not, we'll go to, oh, be seated. I want to sing this before the Lord's Supper is, is given. To Let us pray. Our dear most gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the gift of your Son that you sent down to this earth to die on the cross to give us a hope of eternal life with you. Dear Father, we thank you for his body, which was hung there on the cross of Calvary. We thank you for the bread, which, which represents that body. And we pray that as Christians, we partake of this in a manner well-pleasing in your sight. This we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's pray again. Dear Heavenly Father, again, we come before your throne thanking you for that sacrifice that was given for our sins. Thank you for your son as his body hung there on that cross, shed his blood for us. Father, as this emblem represents that blood, it's our prayer that we have examined ourselves and we are taking it in the right manner that is pleasing and acceptable to you. All these things we pray through your son's name. Amen. Separate and apart from the Lord's Supper, we have the opportunity to give. Let us pray. Our dear, dear most gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for all the many wonderful blessings that you have provided to us during this life. And we thank you for this opportunity that we as Christians have to give back a portion of those many blessings. We pray we give, give cheerfully and as we prosper. This we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Those that are on that list in our prayers, uh, always giving thanks for those that are, are uh, on their the healing road that they'll be able to get back with us in worship, please. Uh, keep those that are fighting for this nation of ours and always pray for this nation of ours that things will get a lot better than they have been in the past. If you would stand for the closing psalm, remain standing for a closing prayer. I have
have a closing prayer. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, indeed, thankful and grateful that we were able to hear the lesson, faithful lesson, according to thy word. We pray that we'll always take thy word, study it, pray for it, pray that we'll follow it and we'll know how to spread it to other friends and co-workers and how to spread the gospel, Heavenly Father, so they will have a, a place in heaven if they follow thy word. We pray for all those who are sick, afflicted. We pray for those who have lost loved ones, Heavenly Father. We pray those who are traveling, the college students that are going back, and may they have a good semester coming up, and they'll always continue to that they are a Christian all the time, Heavenly Father. We pray that thou watch us and protect us throughout this week. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.